enter our continued message from last week, talking about vision. And remember, I left you with this question. Do you remember the question? I don't remember the question. If everyone at CLC had your level of commitment to God and to this church, what kind of church would we be? I want you to think about that. For those of you who weren't here last week, you may think, well, that's a pretty stout question. Yes, it is. It's time to start, uh, stop tiptoeing through the tulips. It's time to be real. It's time to get real. We don't know when our day is going to come that uh, the Lord calls us home. It may be before I get through speaking. It may be 20, 30 years from now. But between now and whenever that is, I need to have the desire to live a life that's pleasing to my Lord, one that lifts him up. And I need to serve him and honor him. And one way that I can serve and honor him is to serve and honor the church that Jesus died for. I know we as individuals are the church, but we as a collective body are, are part of the body of Christ. We are the church. And you cannot ignore this question no matter how uncomfortable it makes you feel. You can't ignore this question. And what I want, what I want to see, and we talked about vision, and let's go ahead and go to it. Vision for CLC is to love God, love self, love people. You say, wait a minute, that's our purpose statement. That is our purpose. But that's what I desire to see for this church. That's what I see down the road for this church, that we're loving God with everything that we've got. That we learn to love ourselves because we are special, made in the image of Christ. We are special. You have the Holy Spirit living within you if you're a child of God, so you are special. Learning to love yourself more and respect yourself more, and again, letting go of the past because it weighs you down and it keeps you from accomplishing and being who God wants you to be. And then we've really got to learn to love people. You are not number one when it comes to everybody else. Everybody else in your eyes ought to be number one. And that's how we need to start treating people. Luke chapter 6, turn there with me. Talking about loving people. And I'll tell you, some of you have reason to not like other people a lot, don't you? How many of you know somebody, seriously, be honest, there's somebody right now, if, you, if I made you, and I won't, but if I made you stand up and say it, you could stand up and say, I really just don't like this person. Come on, be honest. Come on. Uh, some of you not raising your hand. There's a difference, again, in disliking the way a person is and hating a person. We do not have the option to hate as a child of God. We are to love others as we love ourselves. And if I, think about this, if I'm hating others, then how do I really feel about me? Luke chapter 6, Jesus says this, he says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Boy, that's a tough one, isn't it? Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Wow. Get a load of that. Those of you who hate me, you need to start doing good for me. Bless those who curse you. It says bless. It doesn't say punch. It says bless. Don't hold grudges. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you or despitefully use you. That is tough. And I'm going to tell you, without the power of God in control of your life, if you're not walking in the Spirit so that you're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you can't do that. Because our flesh wants to jump up and punch people. Our flesh wants to jump up and tell people what we think about them. Our flesh wants to say, I'm number one, I'm the most important person here, and you need to get out of my space. Jesus is saying that's not acceptable to him. And this is what I see for CLC going forward, that we're loving God with everything that we've got. But to be able to say that you truly love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you truly love your neighbor as you love yourself is an incredible thing. And I want this church to be able to live that kind of life. And it takes action. There's an author, an, an un, unknown author made this comment. He says, I think there is something more important than believing. And there is something more important th than believing. What is believing? Just believing in something or believing about something is one thing. But it really takes action if you truly believe what you say you believe. There's something more important than believing, that's action. The world is full of dreamers. There aren't enough who will move ahead and begin to take concrete steps to actualize their vision. And that's what we need to do, and that's what we're going to start doing here at CLC. We're going to start taking concrete steps to make the vision become a reality. 
Now think about concrete. How many of you ever worked with concrete? This just came to my brain. This may be the stupidest analogy I've ever used in my life. But that, that happens sometimes. But if you think about concrete, you don't pour hard concrete, do you? It's, 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 it's watery, it's liquid, it flows because it's got to flow and, and anything liquid, or I guess most anything, somebody's going to correct me on this, it's more scientific, scientific than I am, but water always levels out, right? You know that. So when you pour liquid concrete, it's going to level out. But when it starts setting up, you've got to work it and you've got to make it smooth and everything. And so concrete starts as something liquid. Our vision and our mission may start as something liquid that starts flowing and we start thinking about how to do this and how to make it happen and stuff. That's the liquid part of it. But when it dries, it needs to be something good. It needs to be something that, that, that's solid, something that's strong, something that we can build onto and build off of. And so as we go forward, it's going to, be, it's going to take action for this church. Now today, I'm, I may sound a little bit like a politician today, because I'm going to be giving you all these things that I want to see, and I'm not going to be able to take the time to give you all the ways that we're going to get there. So go to my website, <laughs> mickeynomorebull.com. <laughs> so as, we, as I start talking about these things, I don't have all the answers today, but we are going to be working hard and diligently on where we think God wants us to go with, with, and how to go about getting people to fall more in love with him. Now, that's not my job to make you fall in love with Jesus. I can't make you do that. But it's my job to live before you as if I love Jesus so that you've got an example. But it's also your job to live in front of other people as if you love Jesus so that you can be their example. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about some things, and then over the next few weeks, we're going to be throwing some things at you and some opportunities, and, and so just bear with us. But James chapter 1, verse 22 says this, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. It takes action. Just saying you know what the Word of God says is not good enough. It's living it. It's acting upon it. It's making yourself a vessel, a vessel of honor that the Holy Spirit of God can flow through. You're not here for you. Learn that. You're not here for you. We're here, number one, to honor and to worship the Lord. And then we're here for other people, to serve other people, to lift other people up. And the better you feel about yourself because of who you are in Christ and because of your relationship, the easier it's going to be to, hurt, uh, to help other people and to serve other people. This is going to be a church about serving. And if you don't like serving, you're not going to be comfortable here. So I'm going to recommend a few good churches for you that don't serve. That's, a, that's an oxymoron, wasn't it? A few good churches that don't serve. I, I don't know any of those. I really don't. But we'll, we'll help you start your own church. The church of non-serving. The church of no commitment. The church of just come as you are and stay as you are and leave when you're ready to leave. The church of, if you want to get ticked at the pastor, get ticked at him. He's just a human being, too. If you don't like that person next to you, tell them. I bet you could draw some people to a church like that. If you want to just stand up instead of praising, you want to blurt out some cuss words, stand on up. And by the way, we serve hard liquor and we serve beer at the counter. I believe you could build a, build a gathering on that. I don't know that we'd call it a church, but you could build a gathering on it. Wait, they have those. They're called bars. But anyway, I digress. I remembered. I used to attend those. I used to attend those. I remember. So as we talk about vision for CLC, I want us to learn and to, to deepen our love for God and our love for ourselves and our love for people. Now, the mission part, we talked about vision. Vision is where, you see it, where we see us going. The mission part is how do we get there? What tools do we use? What instruments? What, what, uh, whatever do we use to get there? The mission part of the vision is how to go about doing the things that make it a reality. What do we do to help people to fall more in love with God? What do we do to help people to, to, to love themselves more? What do we do to help people serve and love other people more? And those are the mission steps as the concrete flowing and then we start working it and troweling it, trow troweling it and, and, and whatever to make it nice and smooth and to make it work like it's supposed to, that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks and months. And I want you to bear with us and be praying for us. Turn your Bible to Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. Here's something that we're going to have to do as an individual and as a church to be able to better serve and to be able to 
to better do what we're talking about. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. It says, in one body we have many members, and we talked about that. We're all part of the body of Christ. We're all members. And the members do not have all the same function. You have gifts and talents that somebody else sitting next to you do, does not have. But think about this. When you're using your gift, and they're using their gift, and those people back there are using their gifts and their talents, guess what? All of a sudden, things start happening and happening for good because people are working together. You know, you get, you get four horses on a, a, a team of horses pulling a big, heavy wagon. And I know we don't know much about that because I don't know of any, I don't see any of my horse people. Anybody in here horse people? Okay. So y'all know more than the rest of us do. But you also know this, that two horses can pull more than twice as much as one horse. It's called that synergy thing. Three horses can pull a whole lot more than two horses and, and a bunch more than one horse. Four horses can do what? You know, you get the picture. If we can hook up as a team of believers who love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, and we can understand what our true gifts in life that God has given to each and every one of us, and if you're a child of God, you have what? Say it. Gifts. Well, you are good. God didn't, didn't give you, and he didn't give me a gift to sit on. He didn't give me a gift to go stick it in the bank and hope I draw all that big interest that the bank don't pay anymore. In one body, we're many members. And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Catch that. We're members one of another. We're a team. I need you. And guess what? You need me. And you need that person sitting next to you. And a person sitting on the other side of the room from you. We need one another. But Christ needs us doing our part because he desires to have a healthy body. Does he deserve to have a healthy body? Answer that. You have to be able to answer that. Does the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sin and my sin and left all the glory of heaven to do that for us, does he deserve to have a healthy body? Yes, he does. So verse 6 says, having gifts that differ, because we all have different gifts. According to the grace given to us, let, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to your faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Whatever gifts God has given to you, you are to use them. For his honor and his glory, to make his church body healthy, and to affect and draw other people to Christ. Would you agree with that? There's so many miserable Christians because we're not taking our gifts and we're not using them. We're doing life, but we're not doing it God's way, we're doing it our way. We're going out and we're playing in the concrete as it's trying to settle, and we wonder why it's got dips and holes and footprints in it and stuff, chunks in it. And you know, the dog runs through it just as it starts to get good and settled. And then all of a sudden, you've got dog prints in it. It's just a mess, and nobody wants that. You want your concrete smooth. You want it to look like what you want it to look like, whatever that is. I don't know. But one of the mission steps to see our vision come in, into view is for everyone to know and understand their spiritual gifts. W you have that tool at your hands, at your fingertips. It's not perfect, but it's a start. Do you know where to find that tool? You go onto the website. And you go under sp uh, uh, spiritual growth, you click on that, and then you go to a place that will let you take a free gifts analysis test. You say, well, yeah, but, uh, but, but. It's a start. Every one of you need to do it. Now, you can do this. You say, well, if I don't do it, I'll never find my gifts. Then I won't have to use my gifts. I won't have to do anything. You're the miserable people I'm talking about. I say that in love. I don't mean you're a miserable person. You're miserable. I know what I mean, so don't take anything bad out of this. I know what I'm saying. I don't know what you're hearing, but I know what I'm saying. But you're not fulfilling what God has for you. You're not fulfilling your purpose. You say, yeah, but I'm old. No excuse. Yeah, but I'm too young. No excuse. Yeah, but I've got things to do. I've got this, that, and the other. No excuse. Stop making excuses. We need to surrender ourselves totally, fully to the Lord and say, Lord, whatever you want from me, that's what I want. Whatever you want me to do, that's what I want to do. 
Lord, show me, help me to understand what my gifts are because I want to use them for your glory and your honor. And I want to see other people understanding what it is to be a born again, sold out, true child of God, follower of Christ. And I want to set the example. That should be your desire. Anything less than that, you're not really seeking what God has got for you, seeking his best. The, uh, we're going to help you figure those things out. But go, seriously, go on the website, take the test. And by the way, I know when you take it and when you don't. So all I have to do is look and see who's taken it and who hasn't. Uh, it takes about three to four minutes, five minutes at the most. Be honest. Don't put down what you want to hear. You put down the truth. And some good things will happen. And then what one of, the, one of the things that Ian has come on board for is to help us get that all together and get people situated in areas where they're going to be able to best serve. If you can't drive a vehicle, we're not going to put you in charge of the church bus. <laughs> Just that simple. If you have a, the dullest personality known to man, we're probably not going to stick you at the front door greeting people to say, oh, we're a friendly church, come on in. We love you here. I don't know your name, don't, don't want to know your name. Well, you wear one of those tags, so I'll know your name. But, you, know, you know what I'm saying. If you don't know how to turn a computer on, we're not going to stick you behind the computers and the, the video and, and the sound and all that stuff. If you don't have the gifts, any, way, any kind of gifts that help you with teaching or whatever, we're probably not going to stick you in a position that you're going to fail in. We're not going to do that. But we're going to help everybody find what they can do. By the way, along the way, until we're figuring this out, guess what everybody can do? Pray. You can be praying for your church. You can be praying for everybody in it. You can be praying for the vision of this church. You can be praying about your part in the vision of this church. We can all be doing that. And I want to encourage everybody to do that. But Ian's going to be developing, and, 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 and we're going to be getting you guys and understanding who you are and what your gifts are, and then we're going to be working with you and helping you to develop those gifts because every one of you, as a child of God, have gifts. Every one of you. And when you're using the gifts that God has given you for his honor and his glory, you're going to experience joy that you didn't know you could have. You're going to experience excitement in your life that you didn't even know was there. And some of you are going to smile for the first time. It's just going to be incredible. And I look forward to it. The church is, if you read through the scripture, the church is the bride of Christ. Would you agree with that? So if we're the bride of Christ, that makes, makes Jesus the groom. And at the bri as the bride of Christ, we're going to look at some things I learned a long time ago, and I love these. And so for some of you who've been around me and been around uh, churches with us, you've, you're going to recognize, recognize these. But I, I think it really brings it out. As the bride of Christ, let's look at the wife's responsibility. We, the wife, the bride of Christ, have a responsibility, correct? Would you agree with that? And we're going to use the little acronym, WIFES. Exactly. The W is for worship. We need to learn how to worship collectively, but I would say even more importantly, individually. Learning how to worship the Lord when you're not around a bunch of people. Learning how to worship Him, and it's not always about a song. Many times it's not about a song at all. It's about your heart connecting with His. Learning how to do this. We're going to help you with these things. The I in wives is instruction. Instruction deals with preaching. It deals with discipleship. It deals with personal study. It deals with life groups. Instruction. We're going to be helping. We're going to be, we're going to be coming up with tools. And you say, well, see, you're just trying to make things happen. No, we're trying to give opportunity. Discipleship is one of the most important things you as an individual child of God could be going through. The problem is, is we don't have enough disciple makers. I need people to step up who know and love God. Who You don't have to be an expert in the Word of God, but you have to love Him and be serving Him. You need to be helping other people to grow in the Word of God. The, the church should be having people knocking down the door say, I want to take somebody closer to the Lord. I want to help them learn His Word. I want to help them learn to grow. And, the, and ideally, I take somebody and help them grow. I do life and they do it with me. It's not always just about a Bible study, but we study the Bible. But it's just doing life. But you take somebody with you, and as they grow up, then the next thing you know, they're ready to take somebody and help them grow. 
Preaching is not discipleship. Preaching is the opportunity for you to get to come to church and hear me rant and rave and then think that, and I'm not, probably not any of you do this, but I still make the statement. And then you go home and say, and I've fulfilled my instructional duty this week. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. We need to be discipling one another. We need to be discipled if we're not able to disciple one another yet. You need to have a personal study. You need to have that personal time. And then your individual worship comes into play there also. And life groups, it's it's going to be one of the greatest areas for us to to come together and for us to get to know one another and for us to grow in the Lord and grow as a body of believers. And that's another big part of what Ian's going to do. Ian's going to have a big part. He's going to have a big job. And he's going to be calling upon you to help him. You say, Mickey, what are you going to do? I want to relax. I'm going to preach on Sunday morning. I'm going to sleep the rest of the week. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to do what needs to be done. But we're going to have fun at it. But I'm thankful that he's back. It's going to take some, a load off, but it's going, to, it's going to give opportunity to get more people involved to do more things. And he understands that, and that's part of it. Many of you have already stepped up and said, I want to be a part of it. I want to help him. That's awesome. We need you. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Turn there. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. This is not a compliment. The writer of Hebrews is not complimenting the people he's talking to. What he's saying is, as long as you've been Christ's followers, you ought to be teaching other people. You ought to be eating off the milk, and, or off the, off the meat, not the milk. You don't need to be sucking pacifiers any longer. And I don't say that to degrade. I say that for you to open up your eyes and your minds and your hearts and say, it's time for me to step it up. It's time for me to learn more of the Word of God. It's time for me to grow in the Word of God. Because my desire and my goal, my vision, personally, ought to, ought to get, be to where I get to the point where I'm able to bring other people along. It's called discipleship. Verse 13, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled. We don't depend on milk all of our lives. In the animal kingdom, I'm going where I probably shouldn't go because I know nothing about it. But I do know that baby cows don't nurse once they become full grown. How long do they nurse? Yeah, but you don't ever see a full grown steer. (laughs) Don't even go there because I mess this up every time. I don't even know what a steer is. You don't see full-grown cows still nursing. Eventually, Mama says, mm-mm, the well is run dry. Go elsewhere. You don't see a baby bird constantly as they grow older. You don't see Mama still coming up and, 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 and feeding them, do you? There comes a point that Mama says it's time for you to fly and nudges them. I know some of you would like to do that to your children right now, but wait till they're ready to fly. But we have to grow for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. The writer here is talking to adults. The writer here is talking to those who should be mature in their faith already and they're not. And they're living lives uh, that are unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So our desire should be to be maturing. Maturing in the Word. You can't mature unless you're getting into the Word and growing in the Word of God. And we need people to help us do that. And if you're one of the, several recently, several people have come and said, I want to grow in, my, in, my, in, in the knowledge of the, of the Word of God. I need help. If you need help, ask for it. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. I remember the day I had to ask for help. After she threw the Bible at me. You remember, I've told you that story. We all need help. And you don't get just to wake up tomorrow morning and say, well, you know, I'm mature in the Word of God. I'm ready to take somebody on. No. You have to start with the milk, and then you have to wean yourself off the milk, and you start going to the nasty, mushy stuff. And then you eat that, and the next thing you know, you're carving your own steak. And what you're doing is you're turning around, and now you're helping somebody else. And it's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. (laughs) And I want to encourage you. I can't even hardly say beautiful anymore without thinking politics. Golly. Quit it. Worship instruction. Then there's fellowship, the F and the wife's thingy. 
Fellowship comes in with life groups. That's a great place to fellowship, or it should be. We're going to develop more life groups. We don't want to be a church with life groups. We want to be a church of life groups. What does that mean? That means it's, it's exciting to see people come into the church through life groups. And I've seen it with some of the life groups. I've seen people come into this church through the life group first. And we're going to put a lot of focus on that. And I want you to be praying about it. Because I have a problem with people who don't want to fellowship with anybody else. I don't get that. I just don't get that. I'm not a very outgoing person. I'm really not. And I'm not a real jovial run around hang around with unless i've got my few little buddies that i'm comfortable with i'm really not but i understand the importance of fellowship we all need it we need it you need it no i don't need anybody you're lying to yourself we all need help we all need support you need people there so when things are going tough that you've got a family around you to support you and to lift you up to do things for you we all need it and life group's going to be a big part of that. We have the worship services. This is a time of fellowship, and we need to be fellowshipping. I love seeing people come early and sit around and drink coffee and, and talk. It's a great noise out there when you just hear this, water, 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 watermelon, 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 watermelon. You know, you hear that out there, and it's like people are talking. It's beautiful. I love it. But here's what happens many times. You're like, I don't want to be around people. I don't get that. I don't get that. There are church acti activities. We're going to have those. We're going to have CLC doing life together. We need that. But we need you participating. We need the fellowship. We don't need the 20% doing everything. I could say tonight we're going to have a fellowship and it'd be almost the exact same people that come tonight that came to the last thing that we did. And it'd be almost the exact same people that came to the same things we did a year ago. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to get you to get on board because this is your church. And we need you. The church needs you doing your part. 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts, honor Christ. Oh, I'm not there yet. Next one's evangelism. Skipping ahead. W-I-F-E, evangelism. We need to be evangelizing people. There are different ways. Some of you have the gift of kicking somebody's door down and telling them Jesus loves them and they're going to hell if they don't, return, uh, don't turn to him. I don't have that gift. But my life needs to reflect that I believe in Jesus Christ and that I live for him and that I'm ready any time the opportunity arises that I can share Jesus with other people. These little cards that y'all are still not taking enough of because I, had, I haven't had to order anymore yet. On the back, it's, it's how to be saved. This is not the great way to do things, but you know it works. People pick these up, people read them, Holy Spirit convicts them, and then maybe somewhere along the way they come to know Christ. It's a tool, it works. Give them to people. There are different ways to evangelize, but at, at some point, the person has to hear about Jesus. You know, we talk about lifestyle evangelism. That's one thing, but at some point, even though my life may be reflecting Christ, at some point, I've got to be ready to tell people how to become a child of God, right? You can say, well, I live as good a life as I can in front of everybody, but please don't ask me any questions. Then there's a good chance that you're that, that the people around you are never going to truly know what it means to become a child of God. I don't know. We've got to trust the Holy Spirit to do his part. Yes, absolutely. But we've got to be prepared. 1 Peter 3.15 says this. If, or in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared to share your faith with somebody else. Other things we do with evangelism, you know, there is the lifestyle, but there's community activities. This church is going to do more of that. You know, I'm not a big proponent of fall festivals and stuff. I'm really not. You know me. I'm just a no stick in the mud. But I do know that eight or 900 people left here with, with, with an opportunity to read, to, to know who Jesus is and how to come to know him. You say, well, you know, it's opportunity. We need to give people opportunities, and I want us to be that way as a church. Worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism, and the last one is service. And I want us to be a church that serves other people. Missions projects. Ideally, we do most of those through, we're going to be doing most of those through life groups. Ideally. I don't want Holly, I'm, I'm getting tired of having to listen to Holly beg for people to come work at the Warming Center. 
just getting sick and tired of them. I'm probably going to tell her, Holly, stop it. I'm tired of hearing you. I'm just tired of hearing you. People don't want to do anything. Leave them alone. Let them be comfortable. And that may not be your thing. Your schedule may not allow it. I'm not trying to condemn you and make you feel bad about yourself. But if you've got the opportunity, I want to encourage you to start being a part of these kind of things. Because it's a service. It's a mission to other people. We're going to come up with different ways of, of being able to, to um, uh, have mission projects and, and to do more community service projects. Caring for and serving one another in our own church. What a great way to serve. Not everybody in here has what you have. Maybe they could use us helping them. And so, that's on Ian's plate, too. <laughs> I'm, feeling, I'm feeling that little plate up, aren't I? He's a big boy. He can eat a lot. You ever seen him eat? Oh, my goodness. But we're all here to help him. We're not just dumping it on him. I'm going to make Kim help him, too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Galatians chapter 6, and, I, and I'm about done. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, and I love this. When we're talking about serving people, when we're talking about evangelizing people, when we're talking about having fellowship, when we're talking about instructing and discipling, and we're talking about worship and those different things, we're talking about doing things. See, the Christian ought to be about doing once he or she becomes a Christian. It's not about doing to become a Christian. I'll tell you this all the time. You've got it backwards. It's about becoming a child of God, a Christ follower, and then setting your life in motion to be a doer. Not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. And serving other people is a great way to do that. And verse 9 says, and let us not grow weary of doing good. Doing good should never become a wearisome thing. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will do what? We'll reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, and we're going to have more and more opportunity. We're not going to be a church about, about just being busy. We're not going to be a church about just doing more and more and more and more and more. We're going to find out what our thumbprint is, what our DNA is as a church, and then we're going to really dive in and put our whole heart into it. But he says, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Everyone. Who's involved in everyone? Everyone. Not just us. Not just the people that we know, not just the people that look like us, not just the people that smell like us, not just the people that act like us, not just the people who drive the same kind of vehicles or live in the same neighborhood that we do. The Bible says everyone. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Christ followers are supposed to take care of one another. We've got to take care of one another. And we're going to give opportunity for that to happen. Because the vision is to love God, love self, love people. How we get there is what we're going to be working on. And we're all open for suggestions. Suggestions. Okay? Suggestions. Underline that word. And then we're going to pray and we're going to ask God how he wants us to do these things. Then I'm going to finish with this one last question that we started with. If everyone at CLC had your level of commitment to God and to his church, to this church, what kind of church would we be? You've got to answer that. I don't want us to play church. I don't want us to be comfortable. I don't want that. You say, shouldn't a vision talk about what we're going to do five years from now and ten years? Shouldn't a vision talk about what kind of new building we're going to build someday? And shouldn't a vision talk about how many people we're supposed to have? If that's the kind of vision you want, I can't give it to you because I don't know. I do know this. If we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, then we will be a healthy church. We will grow, and those other things will take care of themselves. Okay? Not going to waste my time, effort, and energy on building big buildings. I want to waste my, not waste, I want to use my time, effort, and energy on building up the body and being faithful and honoring our Lord Jesus Christ through it all. And we need your help because we're all part of the body. Let's bow our heads.